evening. Welcome to the chapel Wednesday night Bible study. We've worked our way through six chapters of 1 Corinthians. We begin on chapter 7 tonight. Chapter 7 is a, a chapter that is about uh, marriage, whether to marry, whether not to marry, how to behave when you are married. And right in the middle of us is several verses about uh, slavery and all this kind of stuff. And you say, what's that doing in the middle of this? And you begin to realize that it's an illustration of the other things that he's talking about here. Chapter 1. Now, remember, they've been dealing with, uh, Paul's been dealing with these, uh, a problem church, the, the church in the New Testament with more problems, it looks like, than any other letter that we have. And part of it has been, they was in cliques. They belong to this and I belong to that one, but I mean, the more shocking stuff, we've went through at least a, a couple or more of sex scandals. We're only on chapter 7. Remember, the last one is like a, some Christian man or men had been visiting prostitutes. And he's like, shall Christ be joined to a prostitute? And then there was even the one that uh, I guess you'd call incest. He said, that ain't even heard among the Gentiles. So apparently, with all this stuff going on, they've heard that Paul's displeased with it. And somebody has written Paul a letter from the church, and that's where we're taking off here tonight. He's replying to some of the things they've asked about. Verse seven, or Chapter 7, verse 1. Now, concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me. So he's replying to something they've wrote him. And I noticed in some of the modern translations, it's not so in the 1611 version, but in the modern ones, some of them have... This next sentence in quotation marks. And it means he's replying to somebody his Paul's get they've got some of this wind back that Paul's upset with them and with about the way they're carrying on with their sexual relations and all this kind of stuff. So somebody's wrote him and said, uh, Well, that's good, I guess, that are a man not to even touch a woman now. And that's what he's replying to. Now concerning the things where you wrote unto me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, not somebody else's wife, but his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife to the husband. Now, this is pretty, this groundbreaking stuff in around 50 AD or whenever this was written. I remember in the first century a lot of times, especially among the Jewish community and the Gentile communities, is women were kind of looked at as chattel, you know, something the man possessed. But we go through this chapter and we look at uh, kind of Paul's illustration of what he wrote over in Ephesians. There's neither male nor female in Christ Jesus. And about everything he says here about the how the woman how the, the woman belongs to the man, he'll turn around right quick and say, and the man belongs to the woman. He works both ways. Let every man have his own wife. Let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render the wives due benevolence, and likewise also the wife to the husband. The wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband. If it stopped right there, even today, they'd make women mad. But he turned it right around and said, And likewise, also the husband has not the power of his own body, but the wife does. Defraud ye not one the other. Don't, don't cut them off. <laughs> Except it be with consent for a time that you can get closer to the Lord, spend time in prayer and fasting, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and then come together again. That Satan tempt you not for your incontinency or your lack of self-control. But I speak this by permission and not of commandment. In other words, he says, I, I, I don't, none of the other apostles or anybody told me that this is something that the Lord taught about. But he says, uh, I don't have a commandment from the Lord about this. But he's being pastoral. He's using his spiritual discernment here. For I would that all men were even as myself, apparently single. But every man has his proper gift of God, and after this manner, and after some after another manner. In other words, it's not for all people. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it's good for them to abide even as I. And we, we have to put this in a little bit of context here, too, because we're getting to a verse where he talks about how the times are tough and the times are perilous. 
And we learn this outside the Bible. It's called extra biblical text. There are other writings and things that are not part of the Bible. It might not even been written by a Christian, but it's historical records that you can kind of see what was going on. And what was going on in this part of the world around the time Paul was writing this letter is that year there had been a grain failure, which the economy, food on the table, massively depended on it being plenty of wheat. So he's going to say part of this is just applying to these tough times we're going through. Some of you can even, even take it to today and say, well, we're going through a tough time with this COVID thing. You know, maybe, maybe are you sure you want to get married during the pandemic? You might want to put it off a little while is what he's saying. And, or, uh, you know, one of the saddest things to me is a lot of good Christian people are dying during this pandemic from not just from COVID but for natural causes too. And a lot of them aren't really even getting a, fit, a fitting funeral. And many of them are just having a, a graveside or something, you know, to be, be safe with it. I say, therefore, to the unmarried wid and widows, if you're single or if you've been wid widowed, it works both ways, I guess. It's good if they stay single during this, abide even as I. Then he's, he's going to do this several times. He says, here's the, the, the primary thing. Now, here's my favorite thing that you do. But then he said, but... <laughs> But if they can't contain, let them marry. For it's better to marry than to burn. Now, I was riding in my truck uh, several months ago with a friend who has had, went through several marriages. He's a good Christian guy. But he said, uh, I believe the Bible. But he said, I'm beginning to wonder if the Apostle Paul didn't make a mistake in 1 Corinthians 7. He said, I've about decided it's better to burn than to marry. <laughs> The burn here, I think, is burn with lust, desire. It's better for to marry than to burn, Paul says. And then he says, unto the marriage. He's, he's dealing with all these people and all that you find yourself in here somewhere. You're either single, you're married, you're widowed, or you're unmarried. And unto the married, I command. His apostolic command. Then he says, but yet not I. This is really the Lord's command. And it's referring to what we read over in the, in the gospel about. Let not the wife depart from her husband. But, <laughs> and if she depart, let her remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away, put away his divorce his wife. Verse 12, but to the rest speak I. I don't have any specific command that I've heard Jesus taught about this, Paul said. But so here's my apostolic opinion. But to the rest, I, not the Lord, if any brother has a wife that believes not. And now Paul, all the way through his New Testament writings, he says, now Christians ought to marry Christians. And he's going to say that in this chapter. So why would any Christian here have a husband or a wife that's an unbeliever? Well, you've got to keep in mind that these people are first-generation Christians. A lot of them became Christians because both of them were pagans before, and one of them has become a Christian, and in some cases that could make life very miserable. If any brother has a wife that believes not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, don't divorce her, don't put her away because of her. she's an unbeliever. And the woman which has a husband that believes not, if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. I think that means the, whole, the marriage covenant is holy. If one of them's a Christian, the other one's not, then it's not like your children were born out of wed life. You're, you've been faithful to the marriage covenant, but now they're holy because one of you took a vow before God that meant something. But, now here's really a divorce clause in the middle of all this. Verse 15. But if the unbeliever depart, let them depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such case. But God hath called us to peace. I think that means that one of them has become a Christian and the other one was so anti-Christian that they were impossible to live with. And he said, you're not under bondage in a case like that. So God didn't call us to be miserable. God's called us to, to peace. 
But now, before you do that too fast, he says, now think of this, verse 16, For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save your husband, or you'll be a witness to him and be the means of salvation for him? Even though he's an unbeliever, if you stay with him, or how knowest thou, O man, whether you shall be a witness and salvation will come to your wife? But if you break up, then that person has lost their witness. But as God has distributed to every man, as the Lord's called to every... Now, this is that illustration that's in the middle of all this teaching about marriage relationships. As God's distributed to every man, as the Lord's called everyone, so let him walk. And so ordain I in all churches. I'm teaching all the churches this, that if you're... I'll use ditch digger, because that's what they said when I was little. They threatened me. They said, if you don't do better in school, you'll be a ditch digger all your life. Back then, it meant you'd be with a shovel being a ditch digger all your life. Today, you're being a ditch digger. They make pretty good money with them backhoes, you know. But he said, uh, basically, he's going to say, if you get saved and you're a ditch digger, don't think that you're too good to dig ditches anymore just because you can't became a Christian. We need Christian witnesses in all walks of life. And I'm teaching all the churches that. I ordain I in all churches. Six. Is any man called being circumcised or Jewish if he becomes a Christian? Let him not become uncircumcised. I'm not even sure how you do that, but is any called in uncircumcision if they get converted to Christ as a pagan, Gentile? Let him not be circumcised. Now, somebody asked me one time here, I think years ago, said, who would know? <laughs> and I didn't know the answer to that. I've recently learned that. It makes sense. You just I needed somebody to point it out to me. We already know it, but you need somebody to point it out to us. In the Greek culture, the men would go in the evenings to the public baths. And it's just the, like the modern gym showers that we have. All the men would be naked taking a bath, so people would know. He says, don't, don't worry about it, because circumcision's nothing, verse 19. And uncircumcision is, is nothing. That was a, a ritual from the Old Testament. But it was, a, and you can fill this in with any ritual. It, it's nothing if it's something to replace your relationship with God. Circumcision's nothing, uncircumcision's nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God. That's what's important. That's what really matters. Let every man abide in the same calling where he was called. Now, I think he's going to go on to make the point that don't just leave your job because you became a Christian but if you get an opportunity to better yourself we're going to find out that's good art thou called being a servant don't worry about it care not for it but if you be, if you can be made free go for it <laughs> use it rather. not run away illegally now remember slavery back in Paul's day it was something that even the Old Testament allowed people could uh, the Jews could sell themselves into slavery for a contract, work so long for you, and you'd take care of my room and board and all that. We, we kind of do the same thing in a subtle way today by being an employee, you know. You can sell yourself into slavery, and you work, and you and you make money. If, if you, if you uh, take out a loan at the bank, as the proverb says, the borrower is a slave to the lender. You realize you're doing that, you're going in wide open, but you're also saying, I'm selling myself into slavery until I can get this thing paid for, right? I am now obligated to hold this job, make this money, and pay for this note. For he that's called in the Lord, 22, being a servant, he's the Lord's free man. The real servanthood, he says, being in the bondage of sin. Jesus has set you free. You can still be a slave and fulfill your contract. But likewise, also, also he that is called being a free man, when you become a Christian, you become a slave to Christ. You become Christ's servant. Because you're bought with a price. The precious blood of Christ. Be, be you not the servants of men. And I'd take that and say, you know, no matter what your job is, you've got to work for your bosses and all that kind of stuff. But as Paul says elsewhere, whatever you're doing, do it as unto the Lord. He's your ultimate master. If, if everybody did that in the workplace, the workplace would be a lot better. I'm not working for this guy. I'm working for the Lord. I'm, I'm going to do a good job because I'm a servant of the Lord. 24, brethren, let every man where he's called therein abide with God. Now, those seven verses or whatever it was is an illustration. 
of what we get following and even a little bit before here. 25, now concerning virgins, unmarried women, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I'll give you my judgment. Here's my opinion about it. As one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful, I think my opinion counts. I'm faithful to the Lord. I suppose, <laughs> he said, I'm not giving you a commandment. And then he says, I suppose, see this? I suppose, therefore, that this is good for this present distress, this grain failure that we've learned about extra biblically. We wouldn't know that just from the writer. We'd say, what is the present distress? Are they being persecuted? There's some of that going on in that time, too. But I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. I say that it's good for a man so to be. Art thou bound to a wife? Are you married? Well, don't seek to be loose just because times are hard. Are, are, you, are you loose from a wife? Don't, don't be looking for a wife during these hard times. But, and if, there he goes again, if you marry, you've not sinned. And if a virgin, a young maiden, marries, she's not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. That might just mean that, hey, if you get married right now, you've got one mouth that you're trying hard to take care of. If you sure you want another mouth right now during a, a food shortage? But this I say, brethren, the time is short. This won't last forever. Better days are ahead. Apropos for right here where we're living, too, ain't it? There's ain't a grain shortage. It's a COVID epidemic. The time's short. It remains that both they that have wives be as though they had none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not, and they that use this world as not abusing it. For the fashion of this world passes away. We're just here for a little while. But, but I would have you without carefulness, or I don't want you to be worrying over things. He that's unmarried cares for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that's married cares for the things of this world, how he may please his wife, which is good. If, you, if you're going to have a wife during the time of a food shortage, you're, you're, it's good you could be concerned making sure she's got something to eat too, right? But do you really want to marry during this famine? He says. There is difference also between a wife and a virgin. I think some of them translate this one, fiancé. The unmarried woman cares for the things of the Lord that she may be both holy in body and in spirit. But she that's married, she's... Now she's burdened with the things of the, of the world, how she can please her husband. Everything goes both ways, don't it? Ditto. And this I speak for your own profit. I'm trying to help you here. Not, I, I hear people groaning now when they read this letter down at Corinth. I'm speaking this for your own profit, not that I cast a snare upon. I'm not trying to make things hard on you. But for that which is comely, and that you may attend upon the Lord without distraction. But if a man think that he behaves himself uncomely toward his virgin, his fiance, if she pass the flower of age and needs so require, let him do what he will. He sins not. They can get married. I think he's responding to this stuff they wrote to him about. There's all kinds of questions. Right? Nevertheless, he that stands steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but has power of his own will, he's not burning, hath <laughs> so decreed in his heart that he'll keep his virgin doeth well. I think that means that they postpone. So then he that giveth her in marriage does well, and he that gives her not in marriage does better. <laughs> the wife's bound by the law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband be dead, she's at liberty to be married to whom she will. But then see, yeah, it's only in the Lord. You make sure you marry a Christian. <laughs> you might argue with this or not. But she's happier if she's so abide after my judgment, don't get married. <laughs> and I think also that I have the Spirit of God to answer these questions. They've asked him a lot of complicated things that he's tried to fill us in there in chapter 7. Not a general rule for all time and all places, but it did apply for during a food shortage and a famine. He said, you'd be better off if you wait. <laughs> all right, let's pray again. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to spend in chapter 7 as we get ready for chapter 8 and all the other problems that was going on in mid-first century in Corinth. And human nature ain't changed. We know they still apply to the, the church in the 21st century. In Jesus' name we pray and help us be wise. Amen.